Yes, and go low. Pick up the place like a dojo. Bitcoin money, and it's not ruled by a government. So what's going to rule it, right? And what kind of governance models might we have? And so the idea of governance and how we're going to govern it, this new form of money is extremely important. And that's where this DAO idea came into play. And so what do these DAOs do? Now, as you can imagine, these DAOs were invented by technologists. And the background that technologists have in political science, science is somewhat limited. And so they think that governance is about voting. Just like you and me, most of what we do is, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of a pinging here, which I tried to turn off. Um, DAOs are about voting, right? And voting is the way that many of us interface with government, but it isn't really how most organizations make decisions. And so some of the kinds of decisions that you might be able to make with voting are dispute resolution, allocation of funds, code changes, and allocation of work. These are kind of simple things. So what DAOs usually have is a shared budget. We created our coin together. We have a budget together. People can put in proposals to get, to get the money out, and they can propose things that would be done with the funding. And so that's really the foundation of how these DAOs um, were created. And these are a couple of examples of what really like what you might be able to do with a DAO. The first one is Dash, which somehow got upside down there. But the Dash DAO was from one of the first cryptocurrency projects. And what they said is we're going to take 10% of the money that we make and we're going to put it in a community fund and the community will decide what to do with it. And that's what happens on a regular basis. It's still going five years on and the community decides, hey, we're going to have a community event. We're going to hire this programmer to do this kind of uh, development on the Dash. And it's kind of nice. It doesn't govern the entire Dash thing because it's 10% of their money. But it is kind of a way of having the slush fund go to the community. Um, the other DAO that is, this is a picture of, of, uh, of the plant toys. And the plantoid DAO, now this is a really interesting use case. This is an electronic plant and it has a DAO and you can donate money to slide. this plant. Grace yeah. wants to make a slide. If you want to move to the plantoid Ooh. slide, do you have a slide? In the middle, do you, you don't see a picture of cool use cases? No, 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 I'm seeing it now. It's in the same. Yeah, that's, that, so that's Primavera de Filippi and her plant. Okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> And the plant toy, you can feed it Bitcoin or Ethereum. And, and then artists can um, put in a proposal to make the next plant toy, to make the plant toy baby for whatever amount of funds have been put into the plant toy. And if you put money into the plant toy, you can vote on which artist is going to make the baby. So it's a reproducing organism as a DAO. And so these are just kind of funny use cases in, in some ways, right? But it just gives you, I just want to start with the background so that because now you're going to hear the, uh, you know, the use case, but just to give an idea, what are the kinds of decisions you might make by voting? And we have to be very careful about that because, you know, voting is um, a very, uh, I want to say blunt mechanism. It's a mechanism by which a majority of people imposes their will on the minority. And so you don't want to use it for everything. Um, you want to use it for very specific things and fund allocation and which plantoid artist to, um, to use are very specific use cases. And you might think, well, the plantoid is just playful, but you could imagine a self-driving car being owned in this way or a vending machine or some other automated bot being multiple owned by people who divide up the funds and the profits from the car or from the automated thing and decide what to do with it, maybe decide what rates it has. And so you can see that these kinds of things could create autonomous, I don't know, all kinds of autonomous beings that are partially owned by people and the decision-making is made in collaboration. 
And I know you guys all talked about NFTs, and this is another use case where people want to own an expensive NFT together and maybe decide at what price should we sell it or, um, you know, who gets to hang it in there, you know, use it on their wall this month. And so those kinds of joint ownership of things can be decided by yes, no votes. But as I said, it's something where you want to be careful because when a majority imposes its will on the minority, you get all kinds of things. And I think we're all living in, um, in a world where we're seeing the results of that on our democracies today, where, okay, to, you know, some of the decisions that really should have been made by discussion and consensus have been made by voting and it creates divisiveness. So that's my brief idea around DAO. And um, just one more thing to say about it is just with this plant, as, as you might notice, if I put more money in, I get more votes. So it's a little bit money buys my vote. And again, you need to be careful about how you construct your DAO in terms of who has the voting power. Is it just money buys you power or is there some other way to give people the vote? So thank you, Grace. That was yeah, that's my brief what's a DAO. The concept. Okay, Isla, you're up. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Grace. That was great. Uh, we have questions, uh, guys. Put all your questions down on the side, or if you have any thought process as that was presented in terms of you know versus your questions, is there any way or any thoughts running through your mind? Um, um, uh, you know, your running thoughts. Remember, we're really good at that at Glee. So make sure you're writing notes. Use that chat as your open notes to yourself. Isla, you're up. Let's go. Awesome. So. I will also um, connect into YDAO quickly. Then I'll talk through a few b business models of um, very interesting things that where we're seeing uh, trillion dollar industries and extremely complex problems being solved with DAOs. Um, I'll also talk then a little bit about how DAO. I hope that I'm going to inspire some of you to, to create a DAO or join a DAO. So um, we want to cover that. And then we'll have a little breakout session. Uh, so YDAO. Um, so just to kind of give an idea of why is Web3, in a very, very short summary, summary why is Web3 actually different to Web2? And the main innovation that comes from Web3 is the ability to trust people at scale. Um, and this is best summarized by the following slide. So in the past, the way that we trusted in the very, you know, the distant past, uh, and maybe up until we had banks and things, we trusted people based on social connections. And as sort of industry evolved and society evolved, we were able to trust and put, you know, money and, and, and time into things based on institutions and the trust in the, the legal system and things like that. Um, and what Web3 basically is allowing is for us to be able to trust in uh, software and a uh, sort of a programming trust so that instead of having to rely on one big centralized organization like say Airbnb to provide a service or a bank to provide a service, we can actually trust the, the software um, and create a network that's decentralized even if we've never met the other party on the other end or even if we've never met the person that we might want to build the DAO with, there's a system that creates rules that can't be changed. And that is the real huge revolution behind Web3 uh, if one was able to sort of boil it down. Um, so why are DAOs, if we think of DAOs as <laughs> this big, um, the, you know, the community aspect of this revolution? Like, how is this revolution being built? It's being built by communities, and these communities are being built on DAOs. And DAOs are much like cooperatives that we've had in the past, uh, if you know that business model. But they've, you, they're leveraging the Web3 model and the blockchain technology um, to create this trust at scale with potentially people we don't know, which wasn't necessarily possible in the past with a cooperative that had to have real identifiable people behind it. And so why is this important? <laughs> why is this motivating? Why is this something that people want to be a part of? Um, and it comes down to this amazing set of research that's summarized in this video, which I would suggest you watch if you haven't already. And that's what is what, what motivates people, what really gets us going, why do we get excited to come here, why am I excited, why is Sally Ann excited? And what really motivates people is not money. Um, there's a lot of science that says 
basically, you can motivate people to do simple things with money, but as soon as you try and use money on people that need to solve a complex problem, uh, it can actually be harmful to their ability to solve the problem. And so if you want to motivate people to solve complex, really difficult problems like we need to solve at the moment, you actually need to use different forms of motivation. And the, they boil this down to three things, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So giving people the autonomy, the freedom to build the things that they think need to be built, um, giving them the feeling of mastery, they've created something, they've done something, and very important purpose. Why am I doing this? <laughs> what, am I, what am I changing in the world? Almost anybody that you can think of genuinely does actually have something that they care about and want to be doing. Uh, so what are DAOs? <laughs> and so this was just one slide on that. Um, some people summarize <laughs> DAOs as online communities with superpowers. There's just a couple of tweets here from people that are influential in this space. Uh, and as you can see, they're really talking about DAOs as potentially the future of organizations, the future of work, um, the kind of organizations that are going to disrupt trillion dollar industries. And they're not joking. Um, there's an example where a large European bank has actually decided they want to do something, a partnership with the DAO, and they had to go to a public forum that the DAO runs and ask the DAO for a partnership, um, <laughs> a partnership where it's about millions and millions of dollars. So you can sort of see a no normally a bank, the last thing that they would do in their entire lives <laughs> is is, is negotiate a partnership in public, in a public forum. And they're doing that not because they want to, but because DAOs are gaining so much power in finance as this new form of thinking and, and organizing that the banks are actually being forced, uh, if they want to be part of this revolution, to fit in with those rules. So, <laughs> uh, there we go. So what is it that gives them these superpowers? Uh, I will try and be quick here because I feel like I'm going to run out of time. But um, basically, it, I kind of boiled it down to the following. One, they can be global. They can include all of the talent that we have. Um, you know, we have so much talent in the world. We have such big problems to solve at the moment. Why are we <laughs> uh, creating organizations and, and missions and not including, you know, seven out of eight billion people. Uh, it, you know, it defies belief, but the reason why is largely the, the systems that we have are not the right ones for the kind of change we need. Um, they're transparent. Uh, most DAOs are actually completely public. Everything that happens on the blockchain, uh, on, a, on, a, on a blockchain transaction is, is transparent. You can look up the transactions uh, if you know the contract. Uh, most DAOs have the forum where they make decisions about what's going to be done. They have it in public. Uh, so anybody actually can look in and see how have they made this decision. Not every DAO is completely public, but most DAOs really uh, try and have a public, and that's part of the the, the mentality of DAOs is to, you know, decentralize power from a centralized organization to a bunch of people that are affected by this problem, not just not just the customers, not just the investors, not just um, the people on the ground that might be having this problem, but all of the interested parties and actually help them find solutions together uh, or build products together, whatever it is. Um, they're fluid. Uh, DAOs can change. They have a structure where if the DAO decides that they want to do something differently, um, and if there's a majority and the rules are set that the majority can change the rules, then they can change the rules. Um, at the same time, you can also fix rules on the blockchain. So you can say, these are the rules that we never want to change, it's something like a constitution. And these are the rules that if there's a majority vote, we want to be able to change. Or if there's a 75% support vote, we want to be able to change. So unlike a lot of organizations, uh, that structure gives it a lot of flexibility. Uh, they're member-led. Uh, why is that important? Ownership. Um, that topic of mastery and purpose. Because nobody owns a DAO, there's no CEO. Um, it's, there's, the idea is that anybody that comes and joins a DAO should be able to say, hey, I have a great idea for how we're going to rethink our strategy or build a product. And they should be able to do that and gather support like a snowball in the DAO and create that. Not like working in a big organization where you have an idea and it's going to be 
<laughs> thrown out by the if you're not in the right position at the right moment you have no way of actually making that happen and, and proving what's what's possible um, so it's from that perspective incredible um, and they're also censorship proof um, so if we think about <laughs> you know some of the kind of governments and de democracies or so-called democracies that we have around the world um, censorship is is not necessarily a good thing and this is a huge debate right um, but ultimately we have certain certain beliefs as humans that there should be free speech and one kind of great thing about about DAOs is that you can actually be involved in them anon anonymously um, and once something's on the blockchain it can never be taken away and if we're anonymous and not all DAOs don't have a legal entity uh, but some of them are completely without an illegal entity and, and without a you know a domicile, so they can operate without permission of a government or permission um, to say things, and they can also you know be prevented from um, you know losing their uh, ability to say those things, uh, and that, <laughs> as I think we all know, can be a very important quality in an in an organization. So. Business models. How does this apply in the real world and what does that look like at the moment? Uh, I'll just say there's so much happening at the moment. It's like a Cambrian explosion of ideas and incredible people trying to do incredible things. These are just three things uh, and there's so, so much more to explore, but I hope it's these are good examples that get your brains ticking. So first example, a uh, very personal. <laughs> Uh, we have been on a two-year journey that brought us to DAOs uh, at For the Win. We actually started out wanting to build a better venture capital fund. Uh, I had been in the venture capital space. I had seen the huge issues that it has with diversity, 92% of venture capital funding going to all male teams. I had seen the data that said we should be investing in diverse teams because actually they give better returns to investors, considerably better, and they give better <laughs> returns to society and they create better work environments. So there was a really strong case that we should be doing this, but uh, basically a systemic problem in the industry that that's not happening and even any change that would happen is going to take 30 years to take hold. So we were thinking, how do we change venture capital? Uh, we had ideas for doing it and realized very quickly that trying to use the old system of venture capital, the existing organizational structures, we were never going to get enough diversity. We were never going to get, a, get it quickly enough. Um, and actually, the, the structures that they have are super inflexible. Uh, and that's creating really structural problems for the industry. And in that journey, we discovered DAOs. That was what brought us really into this Web3 space was uh, DAOs present for venture capital a, poten a potential and very exciting business model for how the future could look. So going through that a little bit, uh, DAOs can be global. <laughs> Most venture capital funds, there are a couple of people in the general partnership team that are sitting in one country. Uh, and even if they're investing globally, uh, they're not on the ground. They're not there to find the startups uh, in those places that they want to invest. And they don't necessarily understand those markets. So with a DAO being global, we can have a global membership community, just like this one that I'm seeing here. <laughs> um, and those those people can be in those in those environments and in those ecosystems, finding startups, uh, knowing the founders, understanding the space, understanding the markets that they're in. Uh, transparent. So venture capital is extremely intransparent at the moment. It's intransparent in terms of uh, what's happening in the HR. Why aren't women and other diverse groups being hired in this space? Um, there's there's no transparency from that perspective. There's also no transparency for the founders and the decision making that's happening. And it's an extremely frustrating process for founders generally finding funding from venture capitalists. Uh, so having that transparency that DAOs can provide, uh, it can provide transparency in terms of the societal responsibility of building a better venture capital fund. It can also provide transparency to the founders in terms of the process. Uh, we can say, right, you go to our website, you fill out this form. These are the questions that we need an answer on. Uh, and then basically we will take this commute to the community. It will be in a fairly transparent forum of hundreds of people, um, how we're making that decision. Um, and then there's a voting that happens and anyone can see the results and the outcomes of that vote. And then ideally this also transparency with the feedback, what has been said, what, what were the outcomes of the decision and why was that decision made? 
uh, member led. So again, coming back to ownership, uh, if in our in our model and the way that we're thinking about this for the win, we're thinking we need to completely rethink venture capital. We need to create a new ecosystem that has it's like changing the potting mix, changing the DNA of the entire venture ecosystem. And how do we do that? We can't do it alone. We need to do it with with existing parties in the ecosystem, but also with the people that are being excluded by the current ecosystem. So we're trying to create ownership by giving out this token. Uh, and Grace mentioned the token, so we can issue a token to people um, that we want involved. We want to have more angel communities involved. Uh, we want to have communities like Geek involved, diverse communities of people creating amazing things and building businesses. Um, we can provide tokens to those to an organization like Geek uh, Gleek, sorry, uh, and they're yeah, actually... We're very geeky, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so we can provide tokens to an organization like Gleek, and that actually incentivizes them to build this ecosystem with us. Instead of just having one organization owning something and building it alone, uh, it's like you can create ecosystems in tandem and partner super, super easily. Um, and then finally, censorship proof so and in our use case this is a, a slightly different use case what we want to do is provide people that are upcoming investors we want to provide them with track record for ideas potential investments that they came up with so they can actually create suggest an investment on the blockchain um, and then in 10 years time if they suggested that investment and we decided not to invest in it but that investment actually becomes a billion dollar company which actually <laughs> happened to me when i was in venture capital then there's a track record for those people they can go and say hey i have this track record look i did that um and that's really that can't be changed by anyone or or you know it can't be forgotten um maybe as a more common use case we want to build up the track record so that when they want to create a fund of their own or want to go out and get a job in venture capital they have this track record to say look for the last three years, I've actually been providing ideas to this community and there's a track record. So that's how we're using that. Um, yeah, and then just in, in our case, we have this problem. Um, I've, I've already kind of covered this. Um, these are the things we, we need more diversity in venture capital. We're solving that by having these big communities of diverse people. Uh, we're solving the flexibility problem with venture capital that funds have a 10 year timeline and they're actually burning out founders. So they have to close in 10 years. That means the founders need to exit. That means the founders need to work hard. That means their teams need to work crazy hours. That means they're not hiring people that can work, say, only normal hours because you know we all need to work 100 hours a week what does that mean that means that diverse people that have different needs maybe they're raising a family or maybe they're looking after parents or maybe they have a disability or you know depression and they can only work 20 hours a week those people are all being shut out by founders at the moment because they feel that they need to work 80 or 100 hours a week to get things done so that's the kind of stuff we want to solve um Isla, mm -hmm. we, uh, let's uh, do five minutes and then let's run into our first breakout room. Okay? Yeah, cool. Yeah, we're almost done. So next business model, uh, and this is this is one I really love, is that uh, Mira has decided to rethink the media space uh, with DAOs. So they launched as a decentralized version of, let's say, Forbes. Uh, so anyone in their community that they had curated uh, could create a... Uh, content. The content was stored on the blockchain uh, with them as a creator um, and could be traced back to them. And then any revenues that came from the content creators, because they received tokens also for creating this content, so they create the content, they're on blo the blockchain is having created content. They receive tokens from the DAO, they receive that ownership from the DAO for having created the content. And then when that DAO is successful, they're also um, creating revenues with the traffic and things like that, just like a Forbes does. And they're able to split that, uh, that revenue that they get up between the cr creators. So you're getting rid of, say, the Forbes that's this big organization sitting in the middle um, saying we're creating hundreds of millions in revenue and we're paying our um, writers very little. And I don't know, Forbes may not be doing that. I don't want to <laughs> make any statements about Forbes, but... Um, and you can take that 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 middle person out and say, "Hey, uh, here's 
here's an organization run by the people creating the content. And you could also say, bring more people into that and say, who are the people reading our content? Uh, thank you for having been such a loyal customer and reader. We're giving you tokens so that you can vote maybe on what kind of content you want to see or what policies we might want to have as an organization and, and like media organizations being super important in the type of content that they create, uh, the type of decisions that they make about what to do and what not to do. Um, so I think that's a really, really exciting model that um, could be looked at. Um, I know I wanted to actually get your thoughts uh, as well on, on how, you know, things like this um, might <laughs> might uh, be interesting, but uh, just in the interest of time, I'll skip ahead. Um, and then the, the next and final one I wanted to talk about was Genomes IO. So they are essentially the DAO version of 23andMe, which is a company that uh, allows you to take a DNA test, receive your uh, genetic data, um, and they use that anonymized, so 23andMe uses that uh, anonymized genetic data for research purposes. But essentially, when you give up your data for that and you give your data to this centralized organization, you have absolutely zero control in the future of the access to that data and how it's used. And so Genomes and IO is going, going into this from a DAO perspective of, okay, if you come to us as a customer, so we're a DAO, we uh, have created a plan for decentralizing our DAO. If you come to us as a customer and get sequenced, uh, you actually get tokens in our DAO, you become a con controller. Uh, and also because your data is stored in a way that allows you to control your own data, you have control. You can at any time take away or give permission to the companies that want to use your data in an anonymous way. So an organization has to actually come to this DAO and say, we want a thousand people uh, and we need the data from a thousand people or 30,000 people, but for, to actually get it, you have to, on an individual level, approve that it's available for them to use. Um, and that's giving a lot more control. And that's just something that in this space of genetics and, and, and data is very sensitive and, and could be really groundbreaking. Um, so I was excited about that. And I actually bought some of their tokens and, and have been playing around in their Discord, understanding what they're up to and the decisions they're making. So um, yeah, just really, really an interesting, interesting model. So how DAO? I don't think we have time for all of this, but I'm very happy to share the slides afterwards. Uh, I will skip ahead to a breakout session. <laughs> and basically what I would love you to do uh, is take a few, mi few minutes uh, in the breakout groups. Um, everybody come up maybe with one idea, um, which problems you think could be solved by DAOs um, and share that with the group. And then if the groups can just pick one of the ideas from that and share it with the whole group when you come back. Um, there's one thing I would like to share with you that I think is important. Um, for DAOs, I think it, it coming back to this motivations thing, it always happens to start with a mission. That's, that's where you want to start with a big problem, a big mission, something that you care about uh, and that other people are going to care, care about because you want people to come on board, care about it with you, solve it with you. Um, so I'll just give that as a quick input. Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> Well, I'm going to share before we go into the breakout room um, uh, and then we uh, will come back is I put a Google link in chat. Uh, I'm going to do a DAO experiment. So uh, as you guys can see, Isla and also Grace is extremely knowledgeable. So I put a Google sheet for those of you who actually want to take a DAO masterclass with these two ladies. And hold on, my DAO question is you guys vote on what will be your contribution uh, to both of them, um, for them down the road, they'll both have to agree on giving you a master class. Um, and I put a sheet on there that goes directly to them. So there we go. I'm going to practice some DAO governance for both ladies right now. Um, but let's put everyone, um, the sheet needs edit access. Hold on. Let me uh, open that up for everyone. Uh, one second, I will give edit access across to everyone um, so you can see the sheet. One second, and uh, go ahead, please, and put everyone in the breakout room. Um, can you repeat again, um, uh, Isla, the question that you want everyone to solve? Sure. So uh, everyone come up with one idea. What is a problem that you would love to see and think could be solved well uh, in a DAO? 
uh, and share it with the group. And then if groups can maybe pick one idea that they that they want to share with this group when you come back into the main group, that would be cool. So, um, uh, how was that? Do I have any feedbacks from anyone? What were some of the most interesting ideas that came up from out of that? Who's going to share? Actually, Grace, why don't you share of your group? Uh, we had a few different ideas in the group. Um, one idea was um, being better able to gauge the public's, um, I, I, the public's um, opinion on various different issues and having better tracking of the voting that Congress people do so that people can have more accountability for their politicians. Um, another idea was a scholarship fund for people to participate um, in education. And um, there was the first idea, like, it's like I guess, like it's also, and the other one was ownership of public land together. So giving, um, having um, indigenous people own their land together. So those were a bunch of different ideas around Val. Cool, and Isla, what about you? Uh, so I joined a little later, I hope I don't miss anything, but uh, uh, Nicola, I think, if I understood him correctly, he was talking about the sense of uh, in inclusion and family and collective well-being uh, and, and, and trying to solve for that in, in DAOs. Uh, but if I'm getting that wrong, Nicola, please, please add your, your mustard. <laughs> Nicola, would you like to share? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically how can DAOs help humans build collective coherence? And if you look at, you know, if you measure your individual coherence as in like as a human, like all the different voices within you, like how coherent is that? And you have relational coherence like between two people, like I see, you see you, you see that I see you. So there's an energy flow between us. And then you have collective coherence, which is the opposite of fragmentation. Like what you so get hold on, is, Nicola, you're here for the next session. I have to tell you that, right? You're yeah, here for okay, the next I'll session. stay for the next session. Yeah, so, but, so, so that's, well, that's basically the idea. It's one of these wicked problems, and I think it was also a really good. Um, I had the same idea, you know, that was really good for solving wicked problems, and wicked here. problems are these, you know, issues that we can solve with the existing way of thinking. Perfect. So, here's what I'm going to say as we get into the next session. First of all, Isla and Grace wholeheartedly, like, thank you. Like I, I, I came out of here, like guys, how do we feel? Let's see with um, uh, wiggling fingers or something exciting you're gonna do with you. How do we feel about Isla and Grace's share with us today? Yes, there we go. We feel good. We feel good. We feel good. Thank you wholeheartedly for all of you um, uh, I shared a Google form, sign up on the Google form because we, but what we will do is I will have, I will speak to Ishla and Grace and, you know, see if what days they're available to do a master class, um, on DAOs and deep dive into this, um, with you. So make sure you sign up and hold on. I have my DAO, uh, request on there. As I said to you, what kind of contribution, um, as a community, are we going to do for that? So we're gonna we're gonna stress test that whole uh, DAO concept of how we feel. Now